just I thought a fractured skull. <laughs> That's how Spike changed British humour, overstatement instead of understatement. He was often extremely adventurous using simple devices. He took the sound of someone knocking on a door to create one of the best radio gags ever. Now we're going to try to recreate it for you now. Neddy Seagoon has been sent to find a certain tea house in China and he has to use a pre-arranged secret knock. On arrival at the tea house, as instructed, I knocked 6,000 times. <laughs> of the August moon? No. <laughs> now to the characters. Each episode was based on the misadventures of Neddy Seagoon. Enter a short, fat, round blob. Hello, folks. My name is Neddy Seagoon. I come from... <laughs> <laughs> I come from mixed parentage, one male and one female, and that's the way it should be. Neddy would always be conned into carrying out some ludicrous task, like draining all the water from Loch Ness by drinking it, <laughs> or climbing Mount Everest from the inside. <laughs> the conning was usually done by the show's resident villains, a poverty-stricken French wreck, Count Moriarty. Sir Prissy Knuckles, if you kill me, I promise you'll never take me alive. <laughs> and his mentor, the suave British cad, Hercules Grip Type Thin. Keep mm. mm. still, Moriarty. Do you want us both out of this suit? <laughs> Moriarty, don't look now. But it's the man who makes the news at ten look like a current affairs program. Ah, <laughs> oh, we'll be rich. You grab his legs, I'll grab his wallet. No, dear. <laughs> We'll follow him back to ITV. That's where the money is. <laughs> Finn is a public school educated swine who, since the Goon Show ended, overcame his taste for petty crime to become the chairman of Enron. <laughs> Under Finn's careful guidance, Moriarty is now bald, deaf and worthless and has played the male lead in several dirty postcards. <laughs> Waiting in the wings to help Neddy was one of the show's most popular characters, Blue Bottle. Yep, it's a Blue Bottle. <laughs> Pauses for all his applause. <laughs> yeah, not a sausage. Spikes defied Napoleon pose, but trousers fall down and ruin effect. <laughs> Blue Bottle's best friend is the original goon, the famous Eccles played by Spike. Ah, hello there. Eccles is a good-natured idiot who regularly defeats the laws of logic with his own childlike reasoning. Eh, uh, what time is it, Eccles? Um, just a minute. I got it written down here on a piece of paper. <laughs> a nice man wrote the time down for me this morning. Uh, then uh, why do you carry it around with you, Eccles? Well, um... If anyone asks me the time, I can show it to them. Wait a minute. Echoes, my good man. What is it, fellow? It's written on this bit of paper. What is eight o'clock is written on? Oh, I know that, my good fellow. That's right. When I asked the fellow to write it down, it was eight o'clock. <laughs> Supposing when somebody asks you the time, it isn't eight o'clock. Well, then I don't show it to them. <laughs> I got it written down on a piece of paper. <laughs> 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 
Both Blue Bottle and Eccles would fall foul of dynamite and get blown up on a regular basis. Explosions of a different variety would be heard coming from the nether regions of another regular favourite, Major Dennis Bloodnock. Oh, will I never be free of them? A quick nurse for screens and bring a new nightshirt. Bloodnock was martyr to indigestion. According to Spike, his trousers are now in the internal combustion section of the Science Museum. No! Filthy swine! A devout coward, Bloodnock represents the disgraced and incompetent British Army officers Spike saw while growing up in India. The whole show was wonderfully subversive. War heroes were revered, but definitely not war itself. Also featured in each show were two rapidly disintegrating pensioners, saxophone playing Minnie Bannister and Henry Crumb. Min. <laughs> Min. Wake up, Min. What is it, Henry? <laughs> There's a man on the television who's listening to us on the wireless. That's because there's nothing good on television. Ask him who he is. You, sir, she wants to know who I... who are you? My name is John Sargent. What a memory you have, sir. We interrupt this programme to tell you that this is an official BBC interruption. We interrupt this programme to tell you that the interruption to the interruption is over. Good night. Mike Milligan's comedy had an enormous impact on a whole generation of comedians. The technical term being they nicked his material. <laughs> and no one was more culpable than those wacky pythons. I wrote a series called the Q series, which is the series that the Monty Python team copied. They copied every style that we did in that. And mind you, the difference was they had six wonderful performers, and I didn't in my show. Only had me and some second bananas. <laughs> Here to answer those charges is top Monty Python, Terry Jones. Well, Spike was quite right. We stole a lot from him. I mean, for start, we, we stole his producer, Ian McNaughton. Uh, we stole his concept of not finishing sketches, but letting them m flow on into the next sketch. We, we stole his, uh, his idea of d doing away with punchlines. But we never stole any of Spike's material. I mean, we wanted to do our own thing and make it new. Um, uh, and if we knew Spike had already done it, we wouldn't have been interested in, in, in repeating it. Mark you, if we, if we didn't know Spike had already done something, our ideas were eerily similar. Um, <laughs> when, we were, when we were doing the second series of Python, we were writing the second series of Python, Mike Palin and I were sitting in my garden one hot summer afternoon trying to think of a sketch and we just weren't having any ideas at all. And the doorbell went and I went to the door and uh, there was a guy there and he said, uh, do you want some manure, sir? <laughs> and I said, well, not really, no. Um, he said, it's good heavy droppings. So I said, well, I really don't want any. He said, look, it's a hot day. I've got a whole van load. Can't you take some of it off me or something? Anyway, we thought this might make a sketch. So we wrote a sketch for the second series of Python, in which there's a smart dinner party going on in, in an apartment. And the doorbell goes, the host goes to the door, and there's John Cleese with a, a tin bath. And he says, dung, sir. <laughs> what do you mean dung? He says, oh, it's your book of the month club dung, sir. <laughs> You get it free with every fourth book, he says. <laughs> so anyway, about two weeks ago, when we knew we were doing this tribute, um, I suddenly remembered I'd got an old uh, Q5 script sitting in a, in a drawer that I hadn't looked at. And I've had it sitting there for about 30 years. So I thought, well, I'd, I'd have a look at it. And uh, this script dates from April 1969. So this is a year and a half before we wrote our dung sketch. And Spike had already done it. <laughs> 
Uh, Spike arrives at the door. Uh, Mrs. Fuchs? Yes? Parcel, special delivery. Ooh, I wonder what it is. It's on the label here, madam. It's horse manure. Horse manure? I didn't order any horse manure. You'd better take it back to the horse. <laughs> there must be some mistake. Well, there's no mistake about horse manure, madam. I knew what it was.